Hey you four. Today we're going to be looking at the second part of the Giant's Harp chapter from Eric the Viking. So if you remember from the first part of this chapter, Eric and his men could hear the beautiful music. Eric and Old Sigfusson went off to try and find where it was coming from and unfortunately ended up being trapped by the hideous giant um, in a cave that was dark and smelt of blood. And he's got them in a net that they can't even get out of, even with their sharp weapons. So um, today we're going to be reading from page 144 up to the end of the chapter. And then you've got some questions and activity to do in your book. So top of page 144. But Ulf Sigfusson replied, out before they could be burnt themselves but even Time they heard a dreadful roar behind them as the giant found the burnt up net and realised he had been cheated out of his dinner. As Eric and Ob Sigfusson made their way deeper and deeper into the giant's cave, the music got louder and louder, and even Eric began to be caught in the spell of its beauty. As he stripped some bark from the burning branch and stuffed it, stuffed it into his ears so that he could not hear. Surely, said Ob. Of Sigfusson, it is a god who makes such sounds. And then they turned a corner and saw the most extraordinary sight. There was the musician playing a harp that was painted with magic signs. But the musician was not a god, nor was the musician beautiful as they had imagined. In fact, the musician was neither man nor woman nor child. It was the wind that blew through the tunnels and passageways of the giant's cave. And the harp was hanging there in the midst of a great cavern, and all around it, Eric could see by the flickering light of his burning branch dim shapes, hundreds and thousands of them. And as Eric peered into the gloom, he could see that there were men and women, birds and beasts, all gathered round that wonderful harp, each and every one of them gazing up at it, without moving, without blinking an eye. And each and every one of them was gaunt and thin and grey as the rock of the cave. And Eric knew that many of them had been sitting there in that darkness for thousands of years under the enchantment of the magic harp. For they were wraiths, the ghosts of living creatures about to die. But who could not because their very souls had become enchanted by the music and they could not leave. There were bears and eagles, dogs and cats. Lizards and bats and even the giant's sheep all sitting there transfixed. And then Eric noticed Ob Sigfusson falling to his knees, his eyes too fixed on that harp. And Eric knew that Ulf was under the spell completely and that he himself would have fallen long ago, but for the plugs of bark in his ears. But even so, Eric could feel his will ebbing as the notes of the harp made themselves heard even to him. 
and he felt an uncontrollable urge to take the plugs of bark out of his ears so that he might hear the music better. But he did not. Instead, he strode through the enchanted throng of wraiths. Then he reached out his hand to the harp and took hold of it. And as he did so, its strings vibrated along the bones of his arms and entered his mind so that he heard them as clear as if he had heard them with his ears. Their beauty wrapped around his soul like a shroud, and he felt his soul begin to slumber, and his body weaken, and he too found himself falling to his knees. But even as he fell, he kept his hold upon the harp, so that he tore it down from the peg on which it hung. All but one of the strings broke, and he held the harp on the ground where winds could not reach it, and the music stopped. The moment it stopped, a strange groan rose up from the throng of shadows and every one of them turned to look at Eric. Their eyes were tiny points of white light and their mouths cracked open and their white teeth shone sharp like a million daggers in the night. And the groan turned into a roar of rage. And that's a good picture there of all the creatures turning to look at him with their scary eyes. Without another moment's thought, Eric leapt to his feet and still clutching the harp, he ran as hard as he could, back the way he had come, back up the passageway, and old Sigfusson followed. Behind them, they heard the fearful noise as all those tortured creatures from the past clamoured with rage and disappointment and began to fly after them. Eric and old Sigfusson ran with every ounce of strength in their bodies, and yet, even so, those creatures gained on them inch by inch. We cannot make it, cried old Sigfusson. Keep running, shouted Eric. And suddenly there they were back in the giant's cave and the giant himself was blocking their way. So there you are, he cried, and he raised his newly sharpened axe. Wait, cried Eric, we did not steal your sheep. It was this that stole them. And he lifted up the harp and the wind plucked a note from the last unbroken string. And the giant dropped his axe and his eyes went wide with wonder. My harp, he cried and snatched it from Eric's hand. But even as he did so, the furious wraiths burst into the giant's cave, their eyes white and their teeth bared and the cry of blood rising from their throats, both man and beast alike. And there and then they would have torn Eric and Ob Sigfusson to pieces and not a strange thing happened. The giant was holding the harp in his fingers and it looked like a child's toy in his huge hand. But he plucked the last unbroken string and a high, clear note echoed round and round the cave and disappeared down the myriad passageways and returned deeper and higher in a magical chord. A hush fell over all that ghostly throng and each and every one of them heaved a great sigh. And as Eric and Old Sigfusson watched, their souls rose up from their bodies and flew out of the door of the cave to go to wherever spirits go. Then the giant turned to the great, the two comrades, and now he no longer seemed a terrible ogre. This is my harp, he said. On it, I played such music that everyone who heard it was my friend. But the witch of the wind grew jealous, for she wanders lonely through the world, never standing still, always moving from place to place. She stole my harp to, en she stole my harp to ensnare the souls of men and beasts. And since then I have dragged out my days in solitude here, for no living thing would stay with me. But why did you not hear it? asked Eric. Ah, said the giant, that is my one great sadness. I alone could not hear the music of my own harp. Then the giant asked Eric and Ig Old Sigfusson what they would like as a reward, and they told him of their search for water. Go down to the ravine where you first heard the music, said the giant, and you will find what you seek under the old cheddar tree that grows there. So Eric and Old Sigfusson thanked the giant and they hurried to the ravine. But under the old cheddar tree, they found neither stream nor well nor pond, only a jug with a crack in it. The giant is playing tricks with us, said Old Sigfusson. But Eric lifted the jug up and said, in a way he has told the truth. But look, the jug is full of water. And Eric tasted the water and found that it was good water. But what is one jug amongst so many of us? asked old Sigfusson. Perhaps he did not realise there were more of us, said Eric. So the companions returned to the giant's cave and explained how many of them were, how many of them there were. Then the giant took the jug and, to their astonishment, he emptied it out on the ground and then handed it back. What sort of an answer is this? asked Eric. 
But no sooner had he said the words than he looked into the jug and found that it was once again full of water. And when he emptied it, he found that it refilled itself. Then Eric and old Sigfusson returned to Golden Dragon, and after that, they never went short of water again. And that's the end of that chapter. So tomorrow we'll be moving on to the next one. So you have some questions and an activity to do in your home learning pack. So I hope you enjoyed um, the story of the giant's heart.